So now after we have the um, basics of production, uh, prices and unemployment, now we start to use those tools to understand other aspects of the macro economy. And so the first of these would be trying to understand how an economy grows. And that's um, our focus here for chapter 12, um, economic growth. So the typical way that we understand how um, a person lives would be GDP, real GDP per person. We've already talked about how to calculate this, but it's a very general way of understanding um, an individual's living standard it is real GDP per capita. Um, here in the um, United States, let's just get the number here for the United States. It is 65,297. That'd be total production in the economy divided by the total number of individuals. As opposed to um, Ethiopia, number eight hundred and fifty five dollars. Um, North Korea. Best estimate, about $1,700 a person. That's our best estimate. As opposed to South Korea, which is 31,000. Finally, Japan. or it's 40,000 to 46. It varies a lot. Why it varies is the reasons why. Um, it could talk about, it could be you have too many people or it could be that your economy is not large enough yet. Because if we look at it for China, for instance, It's 10261. But that's because they have a lot of people. India. $2,000. So the challenge for a policy person is how do I grow that? How do I rapidly grow the real GDP per person? China made the controversial choice in the late 1970s that to grow it, they were gonna reduce the number of people, right? Or at least reduce the growth rate of people. Because as we see here, GDP per capita is equal to real GDP over the population. So then the growth rate in GDP per capita, real GDP per capita would be how much my real GDP is growing by, by how much my population is growing by. So trying to basically realize, you know, we're to be able to grow the standard of living here in China, we need to control this to be able to allow this to go faster. And you do see these differences here. And this is a this is a pretty good um, chart from um, from Barrow and Martin. Um, there's not a lot I can really add to it. 
except to say, um, you know, for the most part, we grow, but we don't, we're not the fastest growing in the world. And that's largely because we've been growing. We had a lot of growth in the 1800s as well, which is um, before a great deal of this time period. But if we look at the time period from after the Civil War to the more recent present, the GDP per capita has been growing about a little under 2% a year. Whereas in China, which had much more abject poverty in the very beginning of the 20th century at $794, has now increased that quite a bit. I'm not sure why it's saying 16807, showing a different number. Oh, they're adjusting for different prices. Okay, never mind. We should trust these numbers. 16807, 42379, in US 59.52. So how can I get GDP per capita to grow? Um, what do I need to do to get it to grow? Um, well, one of the things I can do is I can get my economy to the workers to be more productive. So to get them to be more productive, I need to surround them with more capital. The reason why productivity is so important is because what it does is it allows my income to grow, my output to grow, but to get more done, because I'm more productive, I don't need as many workers. So that means my population doesn't have to grow as quickly. Productivity is so incredibly important, such that all you do to grow your economy is you worry about productivity. And in fact, you would see a decline in productivity in an economy that is stagnating, which was the 1970s here in the United States. What determines that productivity would be how much capital do you have per worker, meaning buildings, computers, tools, machines how much human capital do they have meaning how much education do they have what sort of inputs do they have and then technological knowledge consists of how i put this all together technological knowledge is about the process it's not about like computers or whatever but it's how i combine capital, physical capital with human capital with the inputs, how I put that all together. That's what technology is. This is just repeating what I just said. Physical capital would be our stock of equipment and structures. Human capital being knowledge and skills. Natural resources being our inputs. And technological knowledge being, as I would put it, how I put it all together. So, there's this famous economist a long time ago named Malthus. I can look him up on Wikipedia. But he basically said back in the 1700s that we were basically going to all starve to death, that the, econ that the population was too large and that the earth could not support all of these people. What Malthus failed to consider is that farmers were gonna become more productive as they learned more about soil and good farming practices. And that as farmers became more productive, the earth could then support, grow enough food to help more workers exist. Techno technological process all, also provides a way that we can sidestep 
a limit to to growth. Um, the question is, is can we do enough to keep this growth going? Um, generally speaking, um, you start to reach some limits about how much better technology can get at some point. You start to reach some limits of how much education a person truly needs or how many computers do they need to work with during their day. So, you, so it can help a worker become more productive, but there are certain limits that are reached. To fund everything that's needed to, to increase productivity, to fund everything, you absolutely need savings and investments, right? Most of you, for instance, need a college loan right now, right, to do what you're doing. That college loan is coming from the savings of others. Um, and that's you know financed by um, not only the government, but some of you even have a private uh, bank loan that would all be coming from um, um, you know your grandparents and whatnot, all having um, saved um, their money over time. As I said you start to get some diminishing returns. To the extent that we save more money, it starts to go to worse, um, worse and worse um, allocations. Um, that you get some point where um, it's not really, um, it's not really as productive of an investment as um, it used to be. So, whereas you can get a lot of bang for your buck, meaning you can get a lot of increase in productivity in a developing economy by just increasing the savings rate a little bit, because that can make all the difference of a person having a little bit more capital, right? Something as simple as reliable electricity in a developing economy can improve the economy dramatically and increase productivity dramatically. So in general, a higher savings rate does lead to more productivity, but there are diminishing returns um, to that higher productivity that comes from more savings, at least over time. And you see this right here, where if I look at the capital per worker on the x-axis, meaning how many buildings, machines um, is the worker surrounded by to do their job, in where the y-axis is the output of what they're trying to produce. In the beginning, this consists of the fact that, um, well, for instance, we can just use this class as an example. When I started to teach online about, about 10 years ago, I had to share an iPad with several um, other faculty members. So meaning I could only make the lectures when it was my assigned time to have the iPad. Um, and it was difficult to do, right? Um, now we each have our own iPad. I don't need two iPads though. I mean, I do remember someone even asking me, do I need a second iPad? And, and my response was, well, what am I gonna, what would I even do with a second iPad? Um, I'm not exactly entirely sure what I would do with it. And one of you is probably saying, I know what I would do with it, but um, because you could tell me what you would do with it. I'm just making lectures here. <laughs> um, so, um, but you did, that's where you get some point like this, where the worker has too much capital, too many toys to do their work, that some of the things go unused, underutilized. And what I said, where you have a developing economy and it grows very dramatically with very small investments, that's our catch-up effect. Poor countries have it so badly, just the smallest changes really dramatically um, improve the economy. Which is, you know, why we do get a, despite what others may say, we actually do get a lot out of even for a country, we get a lot out of our investment in um, foreign aid. 
So what do we generally see here then is that rich countries already have high productivity. So inv additional investments in capital generally don't help productivity that much. But then in poor countries, small investments of money actually allow that country to catch up much more quickly with the, um, the richer countries that exist. Um, okay. So there's a way that if the country's population is not saving fast enough, what you can do is you can allow you can allow foreign investment to come into the country. It allows you then to sidestep having to rely on your own country's population. Now, most of the time, we would see this. Um, most of the time with a foreign direct investment. So this would be like the US based company building operations in Europe or the Chinese company building operations in Africa. And they basically directly own that foreign company in that country. And they bring with it investments in um, how to get more work done, how to increase productivity. Now, sometimes um, what you see instead is you see a portfolio investment. And when you get a portfolio investment is that you've got the, um, you've got the, um, the pool of money is given to the country. And then it's basically up to those individuals in that country to make the appropriate investments to be able to maximize um, their return. Now, in general, these investments are pretty good for those countries because it does bring in needed new technologies. Um, it does, um, it does allow for higher wages that come from the increase in productivity that emerges. But at the same time, um, you do lose some control of your country by the fact that it's outsourced basically to, to people not in your country. The World Bank, it's not a central bank, but the World Bank is kind of like an economic aid organization. Um, basically collects money from everyone um, the world's richest countries, or in this case, what's called the world's most advanced countries. And it basically makes loans to less developed countries for the kinds of infrastructure investments that would help their productivity grow quite a bit, such as clean running water, sewer systems, schools, roads, airports, that kind of thing. <laughs> Those investments that come here allow those poor countries to eventually help themselves and to grow quite a bit. Related to the World Bank is the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. And what the IMF does is it basically, when a developing economy is in trouble because of political turmoil, military conflict with the war, or an international tension, some other country bossing you around, what the IMF can do is it can intervene and help fix the economy, get that economy's currency trusted, lend it money if needed. Um, one country where this is used, at least it's a little bit that are a bit closer, maybe like Katie in Jamaica, where they had incredibly high inflation and they needed help from the International Monetary Fund to get that economic stability. So we even see this here in Hawaii, right? The Hawaii, the state of Hawaii makes huge investments in education and those investments in education are done to increase human capital so as to increase productivity. That increase in productivity is what economists would call a positive externality. 
meaning it helps the rest of society more than it helps the individual. And because it helps the rest of society more than the individuals, that's the reason why most education, including higher education, is public. That's why we provide a subsidy. Um, which is why it's always surprising to me why we have these huge debates about um, you know, funding our public schools. Obviously I work for a public school, so I may be biased in what I'm about to say here, but again, I, I think we're all adults here. I think we can, um, <laughs> I think we can um, embrace the fact that we might not all agree about things and that is okay. I don't, I'm not judging anyone and you shouldn't try to judge me. Um, but I find it sometimes surprising that we don't invest in public education more, even in Hawaii. Um, and I say that because, um, well, it's actually worse on the mainland. If, if, if you don't believe me, um, on the mainland, most public education is financed with property taxes, meaning that rich people who have bigger, fancier houses pay more in taxes so they get better schools. And people that live in you know, poverty-stricken areas, the houses are shittier, right? So then the property values are lower, the property taxes are lower, and the school is thus shittier, thus perpetuating poverty from generation to generation, which also isn't a good thing. But it also comes down to, for a developing economy, one way to help it grow, not only is to give it, um, to promote education, to get kids to go to school rather than go straight to the workforce, but also make them healthier. As I described even in the last lecture, right, the case of Ethiopia in training um, women and families, young families, to engage in family planning and to practice um, birth control as, you know, as they mutually agree to, that that actually does make for more productive workers and leads to higher wages for those workers as well. Um, which is why you sometimes see this kind of, I'm just like going into the controversial topics here, um, which is why sometimes you see these kinds of studies that, you know, one of the things that increased productivity a great deal for um, American workers was um, the legalization of abortion. Again, you're free to have your own thoughts. No one is gonna make anyone agree about anything about that and certainly not in an economics lecture. But follow me with where I'm going here as an economist when I say this, is that what it does is it allows, you know, a couple or an individual the right to kind of choose when um, they're going to engage in raising a child. And um, by doing that, they can prolong how long they're in the workforce, they can build up skills, they can stay in school and thus become more productive workers. But you do more oftentimes than that see this vicious circle. Just like I talked about with poor school districts where poor countries are poor and they're poor because they're poor and they will always be poor because they cannot afford to make the investments that would make them better off so they continue to be poor, which isn't a good thing, obviously. But instead of having that vicious circle, we could instead have a virtuous circle where countries that are doing well invest in the countries that are not doing well with the hope that when everyone does well or when the poorest do well, everyone does well. And they're not doing it based out of kindness, they're doing it out of self-interest, but still they're doing it. Now, another thing that helps an economy grow quite a bit is to have some stability. Some stability that comes from having strong and enforced property rights, right? From intellectual property to physical property, right? Stealing is against the law in the United States and it's enforced. Um, and to take someone's um, private property 
right? Like there's this whole thing going on, right? With uh, Jack Ma in, in China and um, with Ant, um, the financial network he created. Um, he said certain things, um, certain individuals got upset about what he said. And then that result is that he did lose some control purportedly um, over his company. Um, and if that were to happen in the United States, it'd be a much different matter. Um, China, it's a little bit more difficult because it is technically still a, um, a communist country and its embrace of the market only goes so far. Besides property rights, so you also need the political stability. Regardless of what you think of the election and whether the person that you wanted to win won or not, at least we had to have a winner and we had to have a loser. In some sense, I didn't actually even care that much at the end of the day because we just need one. The worst thing to be would be to have two people saying, I won. That would have created incredible amounts of instability. Um, when you don't have property rights anymore, that's when you start to get to have the problems. You do have the fraud, you have the corruption. And once you have corruption and fraud, no one wants to work hard anymore. Because someone can just steal it. Someone can just take it. So why work hard? And again, the political instability does the same thing. It threatens the property rights. Generally speaking, it leads to a revolution and a coup. And no one, including the people who live there and others, no one wants to invest there because you never know if you're going to get to keep your stuff or not. 1959 Cuba being a perfect example of uh, the U.S. used to be incredibly heavily invested in Cuba, but El Castro takes over, um, takes the um, U.S. property that was in Cuba. You know, you get a revolution, you get a coup. You know, the economy didn't collapse. I mean, it was a communist country, basically, in the, um, you know, 90 miles away from Florida. But what it does is it certainly discourages the needed investments that would have helped that economy grow. Now, related to this as well, when you have a, a good economy, a strongly growing economy, generally speaking, um, you, you tend to promote free trade. The only times that you would discourage free trade would be if you thought there was a, a chance that you wanted to build up the industry domestically first to have it compete worldwide, right? So that's uh, going back to what we would have talked about before, which was our kind of our infant industry argument that you would impose quotas, you'd impose tariffs, trade restrictions basically to help that infant uh, industry grow in your own country and maybe someday grow strong enough to do well worldwide. We don't have a lot of examples of that working out very well, though. Um, certainly not in the United States, but pretty much around the world as well. It's really hard to get this infant industry to build an infant industry. But really, the best thing you can do to help an economy grow isn't to be protectionist and isolationist. Rather, it's to integrate yourself into the world economy. Do what you do and do well. Buy from others what they do well. And trade in a fair way as much as possible. Then your economy grows. Then workers can be oriented around industries and professions where they are most productive. And they can buy from those countries where those workers and those industries are more productive. No one loses collectively from free trade. It's the individuals that can lose from free trade. 
and then we as a society can compensate those individuals for having lost out um, due to free trade. Then <coughs> there's a certain extent to which the government makes the investments that are needed um, in research and development, um, like this vaccine that we have and, and whatnot, right? We develop a vaccine, we engage in research on farming methods, on aerospace, research grants that pays for a lot of what the University of Hawaii does. All of these things encourage research and development that then the government can use to help the economy grow as a whole. And we protect this all with a pretty strong patent system. I'm not sure I need to really say very much about that. So, Generally speaking, you need to, let me find there. Finally, they're talking about Malthus. Um, generally speaking, um, a successful economy does need to somehow manage their population size. You don't want to be as direct as China was and, and say it has to be, you can only have one child or two children. On the other hand, you don't want it to be a free for all and just say, you know, we'll give you a bajillion dollars for every kid you have, you know, like old Soviet Union style, right? Where you got like a medal for having like 15 kids or whatever. Um, and that's again, because a larger population does place a greater strain um, on the economy. So you have more workers. Um, you make the population as a whole more poverty stricken. Um, if you have a larger population that you have to sustain. What it does is it dilutes the capital stock, as I pointed out with China. You get lower GDP per worker, lower productivity, because the capital is spread across more and more people. So again, China's solution was control the population growth rate, lower it, so that the capital stock is not spread out more thinly, so that the productivity is higher and that the GDP per capita is able to grow. It's just hard to do it. The Ethiopia example is a little bit better because then really what you're focusing on are these kind of empowerment issues of, in this case, women having control over their bodies and the family planning process, which helps the economy um, grow according to what people want and how big they want their families to be and when they want the time having their children. Um, and then the other thing that we can do to help promote the economy um, growth rate is to promote technological progress. Again, you want people to be oriented around like STEM careers and whatnot that helps the economy grow and make the investments that are needed. Generally, wouldn't spend very much time on a case study, but if we want to feel shitty about ourselves as a human population, it's pretty bad that we make so many people live on so little. Um, that's an incredibly low amount of money to live on per day. Why? Not the environment. That does hot there. Um, it's a variety of reasons. It's depending on your right. You can I can talk to certain of my colleagues in certain disciplines, and they all put it here on colonization. I have no doubt that you know you've got you know white Europeans come over, take the resources, build an infrastructure that's only about the extraction of the resources. And then in the 1960s, 1970s, they put in their own despots to, to run the country, and then they get out of the country. That's a big story of most of Sub-Saharan Africa. But there's other problems, right? 
Because now after all those decades and decades and a legacy of colonization, you start to get corruption. You start to restrict their freedom. And then you've got the relations between men and women in a country that can lead to things again, like low educational attainment among men or women, or even the investments that's made in kids or the poor health, or as we said in the Ethiopia example, the population growth rate and how do you control that? Okay, I ended up talking more about my thoughts about the world than I intended to, but again, do keep in mind, um, I am not trying to, I'm not a preacher. I'm not trying to make you believe what I believe um, by any means. Um, I'm sure you don't want a robot for class, but also at the same time, it's not like you want to learn just what Shaidin thinks about the world. Um, so hopefully I tried to strike a balance between the two. 